Good morning. Welcome. As I said, my name's Caroline, and I'm going to be speaking on that psalm, Psalm 44. Let's pray as we get into it. Father, Lord, I pray that our hearts would be open to hear what you have to say to us today. That our hearts and our minds would be attuned to you. Lord, I pray that we would discover something new or be reminded of something about your character and your love for us this morning. May your spirit help us to understand your word. And may your spirit guide my words and make them clear. Amen. When was the last time that you were really angry or really confused? I suspect that for many of us, we have found ourselves in that space countless times over the past few months, and for a whole range of reasons. So a follow-up question. When was the last time you were really confused or really angry at God? Honestly. And did you dare to say that you were angry or confused at God out loud? even if that was out loud in your head, if you know what I mean. I think many of us probably struggle to express our emotions to God, especially those that seem negative. We continue to look at the Psalms this morning as we have been all summer. And if you haven't picked up yet, the Psalms are, are not afraid about expressing emotions. And this, Psalm 44, is no exception. This is one of the many, many laments that we find through the Bible. Now, lament isn't a word we use a great deal, although perhaps we should, especially at the moment. Because when we lament, we quite simply express sorrow. That's all it means. It means to express sorrow. And lament can be something we say, it can be something we write down, it can be expressed in artwork, or as in the case of the Psalms, it can take the form of poetry or song. And did you know that there are more lament psalms in the book of Psalms than any other type of psalms? There's more lament than there is praise and thanksgiving and kind of positive. Many of them are individual laments, so uh, one, a, an individual is bringing a complaint or expressing sorrow or grief. But Psalm 44 is one of a few which are called communal lament because they're clearly written with a group of people in mind. Now, it looks like it was written almost as a call and response, with one individual saying some verses and a group of people responding. If you look closely, you'll see somewhere um, it's like a, an individual, I, me, um, where other bits, the pronouns are we, us. It has a lot of military language in it, so it might have been written to be used after a, a defeat in battle. And perhaps with the king or commander saying verses like uh, verse 6, I put no trust in my bow. My sword does not bring me victory. With the, uh, the army responding with verse 7, but you give us victory over our enemies. You put our adversaries to shame. But it might just be that the image of a defeat in battle was a useful image. I, probably not many of us have faced people in battle, in an actual battle, um, but I'm sure we, we can still use that imagery and still understand what it means. There are four sections to the psalm, which we're going to look at in order, and then we're going to think about why we don't lament and why we should. The first, verse is, uh, the first section is verses one to, six, one to eight. Sorry. And the first section of the psalm is this great declaration of confidence for hope that the people have. They declare God's faithfulness in the past to their ancestors. They know the stories. They have heard the testimonies of God's faithfulness, how God established them in their own land, brought them victory after victory against their enemies. They don't need to trust in their own warrior prowess because they can trust God to fight for them. Verses 7 and 8 you give us victory over our enemies. You put our adversaries to shame. In God, we will make our boast all day long and we will praise your name forever. So that's verses one to eight. And now you might be thinking, say, I thought Caroline said that this was lament. There doesn't seem to be a great deal of lamenting going on. And that is true. Up 
to this point. And up to this point, up to the end of verse 8, it could be a psalm of praise. There's not a hint of what is to come. Because suddenly, in verse 9, we hear this. But now you have rejected and humbled us. You no longer go out with our armies. And from verse 9 to 16, which is the second section, there is this litany of complaints against God. You, God, have made us a reproach to our neighbours. You gave us up to be devoured like sheep. You made us retreat before the enemy. You sold your people for a pittance. You have made us a byword against the nations. We live in disgrace. And they're saying it's not simply that God has abandoned them. The language that they're using, they feel like God has actively sold them into slavery. Actively let them be slaughtered like sheep. And this is in stark contrast to what we heard in verse 1 to 8. The reasons for confidence that the psalmist had. God, we know you're faithful. You've been out with our armies. You've won us victory again and again. But now you've rejected us. The psalmist is baffled. And you can really sense that. It puts me in mind of that scene which I'm sure many parents can relate to or even with siblings where you have a child who comes to you and you can tell they're trying not to cry. And you go, what's wrong? And they steel themselves and they try to keep their voice steady but as they explain their speech gets faster and higher pitched. Maybe the story goes... I was playing in the playground and I was on the roundabout and Meg was pushing it round and round and I wanted to get off and she wouldn't stop and I tried to get off and I fell over and it really, really hurt. The emotion has got too much for the psalmist. God, you are good and we've heard so many stories of your faithfulness. How you protected and healed and delivered our ancestors. How you were with them in the darkest times. And you taught us that you would always be with us. But now you have abandoned us. You've gone. You've left us alone. Unprotected. Under threat. We don't understand and it really, really hurts. There's more salt to be poured on the wound too the third section, verses 17 to 22. They see the psalmist protesting their innocence. Verse 17. All this came upon us. Though we had not forgotten you, we had not been false to your covenant. Essentially, they're saying, it's not like we'd turned our back on God. Not like we were disobeying his commandments. If we were faithless, We would understand why this disaster has befallen us. But we've been faithful. This isn't how we thought the covenant would work out. This isn't how things are meant to be. We don't understand what's going on. How often, when we really think about it, is that our cry to God when things are hard? This isn't how I thought it would be. I thought following you would mean everything was fine. Now, if we were asked, we probably wouldn't say that outright. But when times get tough, when there's a bereavement in the family, our child is taken ill, or we face redundancy, or we're infertile, or our marriage falls apart, or we're still single, or we're locked down in an overcrowded flat, if we're really honest... There's a part of us that goes, God, this isn't how it's meant to be. I deserve more from you than this. I've been a good Christian. Where's the payback for my investment? It turns out that what many of us were hoping for was a transaction, not a relationship. We go to church, we read, we read the Bible, we pray, we try to live a moral life, and in return, God gives us an easy ride. But that's not how it works. And we come to our fi- the final section in the psalm, verses 23 to 26. Many of the lament psalms end up turning to praise. There's a complaint against God, but at the end they turn to praise. Finding God in the midst of difficulty. Not Psalm 44. 
And the final verses bombard God with questions. Why do you sleep? Why do you hide your face? Why do you forget our misery and oppression? They accuse God of being asleep. Awake, Lord, rouse yourself. And they don't offer any solution, these verses. Just a desperate prayer by desperate people that God would not reject them forever. Rise up and help us. Rescue us because of your unfailing love. Some theologians, Craig and Tate, they point out that at the rational level, it would seem rather futile to pray and to seek God's love when the immediate experience suggested that God could not be relied on. Yet the prayer is rooted in a faith deeper than reason. And this points us back to the start of the psalm, the declaration of God's greatness and faithfulness. The psalmist is clinging on to God's covenant loving kindness as the only hope of redemption they have, even if they can't understand why things are not how they feel they ought to be. Even if God's actions seem utterly mysterious, they are holding on to the faithfulness that they have seen God present in the past. They know that that is their only hope. So we've seen that the psalmist has no problem at all expressing their anger and confusion and sorrow at God. And did you notice that throughout the psalm, they're talking to God, not just about God. They were not afraid to say, awake, Lord, why do you sleep? Right to God's face, as it were. So if the psalmists aren't afraid of expressing all those emotions to God, why don't we? Why don't we lament? Because I think it's a reasonably certain statement to say, certainly in the West, we, we don't. We don't tend to lament in church. We don't tend to lament when we meet as Christians in small groups. If we look at the worship songs we sing, not very many of them have lament in them. So why don't we lament as Christians? I think sometimes we don't know that we're allowed to. We forget the parts of the Bible, like Psalm 44, which show people clearly expressing their emotions to God. Sometimes we think we're not allowed to because we have absorbed some bad or distorted theology. Like, we take a verse like Ephesians 5.20, which says, "Always Always give thanks to God the Father for everything. Or Philippians 4, um, have, be joyful always. And we take that to mean that we should never express anything other than happiness. We confuse joy and happiness. They are different things. Or we think that we can't be frustrated at God because he's the one that provides for us. We can see this. We, we often do the same when people are grieving. We might say something, meaning it really well, but we might say something to people saying you shouldn't be sad because your loved one is in a better place now it might be true that they are in a better place free of pain but it's not that helpful to say that to someone who is currently sad and currently grieving because they've lost a loved one they are grieving and naturally they will have anger disappointment confusion and many other emotions alongside So we can sometimes get our theology a bit distorted, thinking that being joyful always means that we have to be happy all the time. Sometimes maybe we don't, we just don't want to acknowledge to ourselves, let alone anyone else, how hard things are. And that might be particularly true if we've bought into any idea of prosperity gospel. And that's, that's the idea that if we're faithful, we will have health, wealth and success, which is not at all what Jesus promises, by the way. But if we've been taken in by this idea, we might not want to admit things aren't going so well because somehow it suggests that we're doing something wrong in our faith. So we go into denial, pretend everything's fine. Or we compare ourselves to others. We think, oh, I shouldn't make such a big deal of it. I haven't had it as bad as this other person. 
I'll use myself as an example at this moment. I've been very blessed and I haven't had any friends or relatives die or even be hospitalised by COVID-19. I haven't lost my job. I've not been living in an overcrowded flat. It would be really easy for me to say, oh, I shouldn't grieve, I shouldn't lament, because others have had it so much worse. But the reality is that right now I'm grieving. I'm grieving the loss of freedom. I'm grieving the loss and change in routine. I'm grieving that I didn't get to go on the holidays we had planned, or celebrate Jonah's first birthday, or my mum's 60th birthday, how we expected. I'm grieving my son hasn't been able to play normally with toddlers, that Ian and I haven't been able to go out for dinner because we've not been able to have babysitters around. I'm grieving the loss of seeing and being with my physical church family. You will have your own list of losses and griefs you've experienced. So yes, I haven't had it nearly as bad as many others, but it doesn't mean that there's not right, it's not right for me to lament. And then, of course, there's the truly unhelpful British tendency to not do emotions. We don't cry in public, hold it all together, pretend like everything is okay. All of that conspires together to mean that we're unlikely to lament. We're unlikely to rant and wail at God about what is hurting for us. But now, more than ever, perhaps we need to relearn how to lament. And there are some very good reasons to do so. Our emotions often draw attention to what is wrong with the world. They are an appropriate response to injustice, to evil. When we hear about people being murdered simply for the colour of their skin, it is right for us to be angry. When we read reports of how inequality in this society has meant the poorest have been worst hit by the coronavirus pandemic, we should be cross. When we hear stories of girls turning to prostitution because they know no other way to escape an abusive father, it is right that we grieve. It's part of being human, and being human in a broken and fallen and sinful world, that we will experience frustration and loss, both on a big and a small scale. Now, we can face those emotions, or we can attempt to bury them. But if we bury them, they don't disappear. They just leak out in other ways, through cynicism or violence or apathy, for example. So we need to find ways to give voice to our emotions, and lament is a good one. Remember, too, that throughout the psalm, they were talking to God directly. However hurt and abandoned the psalmist felt, he still had confidence that his relationship with God counted, that God cared. If God doesn't care at all, then there is little point in lamenting. If God isn't bothered by us, why waste our breath? But as Christians, we believe that God does care does have a relationship with us, and so it is worth our while being honest. God isn't like a boss who doesn't care at all, that we is just wasting our breath bringing a complaint to. There's a phrase, a theologian called Clinton McCann says, the last hope of a faithful people is a faithful God. The psalmists have nothing else to cling to, And even though God seems to have abandoned them, they still cling to God, trusting that even though it seems like he's abandoned them, he hasn't really. Remember the quote from early on, the prayer is rooted in a faith deeper than reason. Lamenting demonstrates faith in God. John Goldengate, an Old Testament theologian, says, if God gets the credit when things go well, God gets asked the questions when things go badly. This is what the psalmist is doing so well in Psalm 44. Acknowledging God's part in the good and asking questions in the bad. Now we might be a bit nervous about questioning God. After all, who are we to question the Almighty? But Golden Gate goes on to say this, and I found this really challenging. Failing to accuse God implies a failure to acknowledge who is really in charge, who really has power. 
I'm going to read that again. Failing to accuse God implies a failure to acknowledge who is really in charge, who really has power. In other words, if we think God really has the power to change things, we should be asking God why he isn't changing things. Have you asked God, why have you let this coronavirus pandemic happen? Why is this happening to us? Have you fallen asleep? We don't always get an answer to our questions. We certainly don't always get an answer that we like. An important thing to go back to is the false idea that bad things don't happen to faithful Christians. If we take this psalmist's protest of innocence at face value, as in we believe that them when they say that they were faithful, then the psalm is clear that this has always been the case. Just because you're faithful doesn't mean that bad things don't happen. But we also see just a hint um, in verse 22. It says, yet for your sake we face death all day long. There's just a little hint there that somehow suffering can be seen in the service of the kingdom of God. Somehow God can use suffering to further his kingdom. If I read the rest of that verse, yet for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Someone else who's referred to as a sheep going to slaughter. Jesus going to the cross of his crucifixion as like a sheep going to slaughter. Somehow God can use suffering to further his kingdom. And seen in this light, suffering's not a mark of rejection from God's love at all. This is clearest at the cross. Jesus felt abandoned by God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He certainly suffered on the cross and in the betrayal, the humiliation, the torture and everything that led up to that. But through his suffering, God won the greatest victory of all. Redemption and reconciliation for all humanity and all creation. So there's a glimmer of hope there. So as I finish, this is a no-holds-barred psalm. They are not afraid from telling God exactly what is bothering them and exactly what they think of God right now. It's okay for us to express our anger and our confusion and sadness to God. God knows anyway. And it's really healthy for us to do that. Doesn't mean we'll get any answers to our questions but at least reminds us of who is really in charge and keeps us talking to God. So this week, a challenge for us. Let's be honest with God. There will be things in our lives right now or in the last few months that have hurt, grieved and confused us. You know, like a global pandemic. This week, let's take time to acknowledge them and bring them before God. Don't be afraid to say it how you really feel. If that's God, why are you asleep? Say it. God knows that you're thinking it already and he's big enough to take any accusations we throw his way. It makes our relationship with God more faithful if we are honest. We're actually going to have a bit of time to do that right now. I mentioned before, there's not very many worship songs that speak about lament, um, and John's doing his bit to rectify that and has written a song during lockdown called Till You Speak Again. It's a song of lament. Uh, we're going to listen to it now. It's just a demo version, so it's not as polished as some of the other ones that you uh, will have seen John produce, but have a listen to the words. If you find it helpful, use this time to reflect. Use this song to lament, or to inspire you to lament in your own way. But let's learn how to lament again. When my heart is broken and my heart aches, when breathing feels heavy. 
from the way of what I couldn't imagine. But look this way, why didn't it change? I prayed for mountains to move for you to do what you can do. How long will I have to wait for you? Where is the breakthrough? But you, Lord, hear the cry of my heart. Even in my questions, you are here with me. Jesus, I need your my heart can't take this much I'm running to your arms In the joy and the sorrow So I will worship you I'll choose to worship you Father, you gave And though you take away hardships that I face when it feels like the hurt is here to stay and every moment of my pain I call on your name and teach me to have faith through the storm teach me to trust you when I don't know Teach me to follow what you've said Till you speak again Oh, and Jesus, I need your love My heart can't take this much I'm running to your arms In the joy and the sorrow Stop your name again and again. If you give, I will praise. If you take, I will praise. I lift up your name again and again. If you give, I will praise. If you take, I will praise. I lift up your name again and again and again. heart can't take this much I'll run into your in the joy and the sorrow so I will worship you I'll choose to worship you Father you gave and though you take away Still I will praise 